So this is uh, this uh, funny format where there's only discussions. Um, and we, are having, we, are, we have a very exciting session uh, this afternoon, um, mainly concerning about uh, numerical simulations uh, in many different scales and, um, and the connection of uh, dark matter halos with galaxies. It's be really exciting. So um, I go um, with the order of, uh, so we have uh, Carlos Frank, he has not arrived yet. Um, then um, maybe we change the order of uh, uh, Ginevra uh, Favoli and uh, Maria Celeste Artale. And they're going to present, uh, uh, they're going to answer things. Uh, they're going to present a few uh, minutes. They're going to talk about a few minutes about their work. And for the posters, uh, they, they're going to introduce themselves, uh, Daniela Galahaga Espinosa and Federico Toroni. So um, please, Ginevra, go ahead. Yes, thank you. I will share a few slides that I have prepared. Okay. I think you can see them well. Otherwise, yes. let me know. Okay, yes. so... Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ginevra Favole. I'm a postdoc at TPFL in Switzerland. And in my talk, I've uh, mainly presented my last work, uh, which is done in collaboration, especially with Antonio Montero Dorta and Celeste Artale, and also other people here. So basically, in, um, this work will be soon on archive. So here, what we have done uh, is to explore a possible extension of the subhalo abundance matching, the Shen model, using the age matching technique that was implemented in 2013 by hearing and collaborators. So uh, Shem, it is well known that Shem works well with uh, galaxy samples that are complete, uh, but for subsamples of galaxies that are selected in any galaxy properties, uh, it needs some modification in order to accurately predict the and to accurately predict the clustering properties of these subsets of these subsamples at all scales. So basically, uh, we have implemented the SHEM plus age matching in uh, the illustrious TNG 300 hydrodynamical simulation, which is shown in this uh, slice here, using different secondary halo and galactic properties that are reported here in these squares. Uh, in particular, we have explored how well uh, the halo tidal overdensity delta R and the halo tidal anisotropy alpha R, which are defined in these two squares here, and uh, they come from the eigenvalues of the halo tidal tensor. Um, so we have uh, checked how well they performed when used as secondary properties uh, in the age matching technique. Uh, so what we found is that uh, the halo properties that correlate uh, the most uh, with the galaxy color and uh, with the specific star formation rate are the redshift of starvation, the starve, and is uh, uh, over density, tidal over density delta R, while all the other properties explored, so also alpha R, perform poorly. Um, so basically, these two uh, quantities give the best uh, clustering models, both as a function of colors in these uh, uh, plots and as a function of specific star formation rate. Uh, so this shame plus age matching technique is particularly useful for analyzing the clustering properties of emission line galaxies and quasars uh, that will be targeted by next generation surveys. And this is my resume. I cannot hear you anymore. It's, sorry, I was muted. I said, thank you, Ginevra. And <laughs> Maria Celeste, please. I go, yeah. Let me see if I can share also. You should be able to share. If I'm doing correctly in between so many things, I have it open, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think now you can see. Yeah, right? Yes. Wait, and let me, okay. So basically, uh, my in my talk, uh, I tried to give you some ideas about um, three papers in which I'm involved that I was yeah, involved recently. Uh, well, sorry, first I'm Celeste Artale. I'm a postdoctoral fellow from uh, the University of Innsbruck in Austria. And well, yeah, basically the idea was uh, using hydrodynamical cosmological simulations, we can study 
the connection between the dark matter halos and the galaxies, and in particular, uh, the, the impact of the secondary halo bias in the galaxy population. And the, for those that uh, don't know what I mean with the secondary halo bias is uh, basically at a fixed dark matter halo mass, uh, how uh, the se a secondary property of the dark matter halo impact in uh, the, the halo clustering, how, how it impacts in the uh, dark matter halo clustering. So, and, and then uh, what I did in this, when I was involved in these works was to investigate the impact of this secondary halo bias in the galaxy population. The first uh, paper I show you in, in, in my talk was uh, this, led by Antonio Montero Dorta, uh, where we used the Illustris TNG 300, the central galaxies of Illustris TNG 300, and we investigate, so considering the formation time and the spin uh, of the dark matter halos as a secondary uh, property, how it impacts in the uh, differences in the galaxy clustering. Uh, then the, yeah, the second paper I discussed in my talk was this one, where we consider not only the secondary halo bias, but also the concept of occupancy variations, which means, uh, so again, the differences in the, the spatial distribution of the galaxy clustering, but also considering the the, halo, the variations in the halo occupation distribution uh, when we consider a secondary property of the dark matter halos. In, the case, uh, in this case, we use uh, Eagle simulation and Illustri simulation. And uh, well, uh, I discussed in, in my talk, but we found differences in the, in the halo occupation distribution when we consider the environment and the formation time of the halo as a secondary dependence. And the third paper that I discussed in my talk uh, is this one and this on, in, on archive, uh, where we use the kinetic sunayev seldovich effect as a proof of concept for the halo spin bias. For this, we use Illustris TNG 300 and uh, the galaxy clusters, the massive clusters that we have. And we found uh, very nice uh, results where we uh, think that in the near future, uh, well, in, or in the future with the future uh, detectors for the kinetic sonic seldovich effect, we will be able to identify uh, the halo spin bias. Uh, and that's all. Thank you, Maria Celeste. So I just want to tell, tell people that uh, I sent an email to Carlos Frank. Um, hopefully he will join us at some point. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's go to the poster presenters to introduce themselves. Um, so Daniela, please. So hi everybody, I'm Daniela Galarraga Espinosa and I'm a PhD student at uh, IAS uh, in Orsay. So my work focuses on the properties of uh, galaxies and gas in, in the cosmic web. So I mainly study cosmic filaments and, uh, and how the, 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 these structures uh, host uh, the, the gas and the properties of, of this gas and, and how can we detect them from the, the galaxy distribution. And I think that's enough for a poster. <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Thanks. Uh, so Federico, please. Hi, everyone. I am Federico Dosone, a PhD student from Rome. And in my poster, I presented uh, a scheme to do fast simulations using uh, the Lagrangian picture. And these schemes uh, builds upon uh, Lagrangian perturbation theories, but I added also the halo model and the spherical collapse. And we find that the density field statistics in this way improves over uh, Lagrangian perturbation theories. And that's it. Federico. Uh, so Carlos uh, has not joined us yet. So let's start. I think we should start with the questions then. Um, so as usual, people can raise uh, their hands to ask questions. And uh, if you are a co-host, you can just write uh, in the chat that uh, you want to ask uh, a question. Um, so I don't see any questions yet. So I, I can start just to um, break the ice. Actually, I have to say that my dream for this format of workshop is that when, I, when we finish the introduction with people talking about their work, there'll be like uh, 10 hands up. So this is my dream for the workshop, okay? I hope by the end of this workshop, people will 
do this. Just uh, start asking uh, questions. Um, oh, okay. I have, uh, sorry. Yeah, I have a question for Daniela. Yes, <laughs> go can. ahead. Yeah, because, sorry, I couldn't uh, go deep into your papers yet, but um, I'm very interested in, and um, I wanted to know more in detail, how do you identify the filaments in TNG? And uh, yeah, if you can explain. Yes, yes. Yeah, so um, yes, I used the, the numerical simulation illustrious TNG, uh, the, the larger box. So we have like um, more, more statistics. And I do a mascot in the, the galaxies, so to, in order to follow observational limits. So the, the galaxies that I take, I have masses of 10 to the 9 up to 10 to the 12 solar masses. And then I run, so Disperse. Disperse is a publicly available uh, code that uh, detects the filaments based on the, the topology of the density field. So um, basically you compute the DTFR of, uh, of the, the Delaunay uh, tessellation of, uh, of the, the galaxy distribution. And uh, a filament goes from the maximum density uh, critical point uh, to uh, the, the saddle of the density field. So basically in, within this framework, uh, filaments are sets of segments uh, that uh, connect the, these two uh, points of the density field, if that answers your question. Yes, yes, thanks. Um, um, so before Oliver, I, I have a question to any of you, because Carlos wrote me <laughs> that he needs a link to get. No, to I, I now finally managed to get on. Uh, ah. but, uh, Ah, my, my, okay. The problem was the password was in capitals and it's supposed to be in small letters. <coughs> no, it's in small letters. It's in small letters. Yeah, but so, they okay. had it in capitals, so I was stuck. Ah, anyway. yeah, it's small but letters. Okay, I'm sorry about now. that, Carlos. I'm uh, here now. But sorry, perfect I'm timing. So, Carlos, probably this is the first time you're joining. So, the, the uh, what we do here is that. Uh, the uh, presenters, they, they go like two or three minutes about the, what they talked about. So of course people watch their videos beforehand. And then we start with questions. So if you, if you wanna spend two or three minutes talking about uh, uh, your, your, uh, your video and then, and then we start the questions, is that okay? Yes, uh, do, you, do you have my slides? Do you want to show them or? Um... Uh, I can, sorry, I'll make you a co-host. What's that? A uh, co-host. Okay. Yeah. Shall I think you. I, I will. Sorry, just one second. So now you should be the co-host. A co-host. So you can share as your slides. If you. Okay. Let me see if this works, because this computer tends to. It's very old and it crashes PowerPoint. But let, let's see if it works. Um. Now, so. I'll share my screen in a second. All right. Okay. Yeah, so. the, yeah, the idea is just to, to spend two or three minutes. Of, uh, but all right. Okay. So let me let me share the screen. And um, how do I share the screen here? Right. Okay. Now, so I hope my PowerPoint's not gonna crash, but um, all right. So uh, can uh, people see this now? Yes. All right, so basically what I talked about was um, how to rule out CDM, how to do a, a conclusive test of CDM. And uh, it's essentially based on uh, what I think is the most fundamental prediction of the CDM model, which is the mass function of halos, the dark halo mass function. So I think um, here it is actually the, um, so here's a, a calculation, very recent. Uh, this was, comes from a paper that came out in Nature in September by these people here. And what you see is the halo mass function uh, uh, over 25 orders of magnitude in mass. So from, uh, in the case of CDM, the power spectrum of initial perturbations cuts off at about an Earth mass. And, um, but then above that cutoff, all the way to galaxy clusters, we have halos. And you see here uh, this beautiful power law that has a slope of minus 1.9 uh, that describes the number of halos 
of different mass. So there are, um, you know, many orders of magnitude in mass, 25 orders of magnitude in mass from Earth mass to galaxy clusters, and also uh, 25 orders of magnitude in abundance. So obviously most of the halos are very small. So what my talk is about is how, do you can, how can you probe different aspects of this mass function? So it turns out that if you're interested in only, if you, only you have access to our telescopes and things you can actually see in a telescope, then you only probe this regime from 10 to the 10 onwards because uh, <clears throat> below about 10 to the 10, actually below about five times 10 to the nine, from here onwards, all these halos are dark. So they never make a galaxy. And this is the reason for this. I explain in my slides it has to do with the fact that um, at reionization, the hydrogen gets uh, reionized. It also gets heated <clears throat> above the uh, virial temperature of the halos that exist at that time. So that's the basic physics why uh, when you look at, um, at most of these halos, uh, at these of halos here, whoops, sorry, they never make a galaxy, right? The little ones below five times 10 to the nine, they're all completely dark. So if you're looking only at say dwarf galaxies or satellites, you can only probe this part. You can do that. And the answer is it agrees, CDM agrees very well with observations with the satellite <clears throat> abundance of the Milky Way. Then between about 10 to the 10 and 10 to the seven, this part here, you can probe with gravitational lensing with a particular form of gravitational lensing where you have a strong lens uh, which is, happens when you have a source and then you have a lens and the observer, when they're lined up, you get a strong lens and you get an Einstein ring. Now, in, if in between the uh, light source and us, there are small halos of mass 10 to the six, 10 to the seven, 10 to the eight, they produce a distortion in the Einstein rings, which you can try to detect. And if you do, then you can probe this part. Uh, and then of course, the, if you don't find any halos uh, of this mass, then that's the end of CDM. Or if you find the wrong number, that's the end of CDM. And then finally, I talked about how you can probe all this part, and that is, um, which are all dark, of course, as I said, and you can probe those with uh, looking at annihilation radiation, because um, certain classes of cold dark matter particles are uh, Majorana particles, so they can annihilate into gamma rays if the mass is of order uh, GEVs, and then those gamma rays uh, are, are produced by these halos. And I discussed how many, you know, what kind of um, luminosities you would expect from these halos. So that's what my talk was about. So is that a, uh, is that a good summary? Perfect, Carlos. Thank you very much. So, so now it's all discussions. And so again, I ask people to raise their hands uh, if they want to ask questions. So Oliver, please go ahead. Um, yeah, hi. Um, uh, one question to Maria, actually. Um, in in your talk, at some point, you say that you find a correlation between um, between the size of galaxies, even at, at fixed dark matter halo mass, and the bias of these galaxies. And um, first of all, could, could you uh, say some details how how galaxy size is defined there? And then also, do you have any speculation for why this might be? You're muted, Maria. Sorry, <laughs> uh, the typical problem. Yeah, um, no, I mean, the sizes I extracted directly from the, the illustrious TNG simulation is based, I mean, from the galaxy catalog is the half mass radius basically obtained from that. And um, yeah, we we don't know. Yeah, you mean yeah the bias that we found, but yeah, we we really don't have a clue of of what is the reason of of that. Yeah, it's uh, something. Yeah, I mentioned in in the in the talk. Yeah, but could this almost be like like um, assembly bias in disguise? Because different, if you have halos of the same mass but say different concentrations, then maybe they form galaxies of different sizes or something or. Uh, yeah, could, yeah. You mean, yeah, based on concentration, yeah. Yeah, we didn't uh, test that. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Maria Celeste, and thank you, Oliver. So, Hideki, please go ahead. Uh, I have a question to also Maria. Uh, you showed in the uh, plot uh, K1 
Kc uh, correlation of Kc effect, uh, effect and the uh, spin bias. Uh, yes. Can you uh, explain why uh, there is a positive correlation? Uh, let me sh let me share the screen again, and you tell me uh, exactly. Uh, yeah. So should be. Uh, to yes. where exactly to this? You mean? Yes. Yes. Uh, because ah uh, yeah you mean for the the minus of of well but this is the way we 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 compute the ks set i i don't get your point right. um, or yeah or here so basically what we do is uh, so we we account for uh, the velocity of the gas cells and uh, we compute the signal in this way with uh, so and we can also identify the the dipoles we divide the the two regions of the dipoles and then we we compute but then uh, why do you expect the the opposite sorry maybe i i, I lost your question i didn't understand no, no, just uh, why there is a positive correlation if you increase the m mass and uh, it's a spin, it means kind of, I, I'm not clearly sure, spin is high. Is this the meaning of the prop? Uh, it's not, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah, I, I mean, for the spin, What's but a, for the spin, what's the relationship we... of the spin and the KC effect? Uh, yeah, but I mean, here you mean well, but we know that uh, in general, well, not well for the spin, no, but um, I I don't know if I get or you Wait. want. I see your <laughs> now. You want to say something? <laughs> Maybe I can. I can actually help here. Uh, yeah, so the, the KSC effect is related, it's proportional, it's basically probing the, the intra-cluster gas. So the strength of the KSC effect is proportional to how to the rotation of the gas, to the spin, to the angular momentum of the intra-cluster gas. Um, so the, the connection that we do here is that, that uh, the intra-cluster gas is also tracing the halo, uh, in this case the spin of the halo. So for more massive halos, you typically have more gas. Yeah. Uh, you also have a, a higher angular momentum, higher spin. So it's, it's, uh, this is what you, you should expect. Uh, okay. It's, Sorry, I'm, it's, I'm replying because I'm the author. No, no, the... thanks, because I, I <laughs> lost the, um, the, yeah, thanks. Uh, okay, uh, it's based on okay, the density, uh, high density of uh, intercluster media. Yeah. Basically, okay. Right, so that, the, there is a relationship of a velocity, uh, uh, just not density, velocity to spin or something. They are velocity and the spin. Is, is, is there some correlation or something? Um, just, uh, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. So the KSC is tracing the rotation. The, the basically, it's the uh, coherent rotation of gas, intracluster gas, whereas the TSC, the thermal, is basically tracing the amount of gas that you have inside so you'll be tracing the halo mass um, that's basically the the connection that's why we could use it to try to to probe spin bias okay uh, thank you I, I thank you so thank you antonio thank you maria thank you Becky. so now alex please thanks this is a kind of a leading question for carlos which is uh so if you if you don't see any annihilation signal is your is your prior that uh, stronger that the WIMP model is wrong or that the CDM model is wrong? Well, yes. Yeah, so, I mean, the, no, exactly that. Uh, if you don't see annihilation radiation, you don't know whether there's still CDM made of particles that are, don't produce gamma rays. So, which could happen in many models and could also um, 
even even with wimps, you know, well, the, I don't know how, to what extent, how much you want to stretch the word wimp, but if the mass is very small, then they won't produce gamma rays, but even if they annihilate. No, but I think the absence of annihilation radiation is not going to be a definitive test. However, the absence of, uh, of lensing perturbations in Einstein rings, that will kill it, right? Because there, the, um, that really tells you whether these uh, small halos are there or not, right? And um, if you don't see them with the, uh, with the uh, perturbations of Einstein ring, then that really is the end of CDM, uh, or if you don't see enough. Now, the trouble is, of course, um, if you don't see them, then you have to convince the world that you don't see them, not because you're blind, but because they're not there. And so that's that's a, that's a tricky part. How do you how do I convince you uh, 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 that um, the uh, if I say to you, look, I look for these sub so for these small halos, and I don't find them. CDM exists them. They're not there. CDM is dead. How do I convince you that um, in fact they really are not there? So that's 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 the tricky part. But um, and, and it's good that we have. I mean, there are multiple ways that we can search for these these small halos, and so we should get consistent results. You know, in the local universe as well as with uh, with the strong ones. Right. I mean, there are not that many ways. <laughs> There's there only three many. ways. I mean, I know three ways, right? So one, one is the, the distortions in lensing. The other one is the gaps in, in, in streams, in global cluster tidal streams, that uh, if, you, if you have, uh, you know, for people who don't know about this, so if you have a very cold stream, like a tidal stream stripped off uh, a global cluster in the Milky Way, then if the Milky Way has uh, all these small, in this case, subhalos floating around, then you can calculate the probability that one of them would cross the stream. And if it crosses the stream, it leaves a signal that you can in principle measure. And this already claims that such gaps in streams have been discovered, but they're not totally compelling yet. So, the, um, so that's, that's the second method. So it's gravitational lensing, that one. And then the other one is annihilation radiation, but it does have the, uh, it's, not, it's not a conclusive test either, right? Because you might have CDM uh, I mean, axions, for example, is a perfectly good candidate for CDM, and it, you'll never see that in X-ray in gamma rays. So, so I think the only two methods that I know that could really rule it out are um, are, are the gapology, the gaps in streams, or the lensing. So, which other ones do you have in mind? I mean, I think those are the two right now that push us, that get us down below the threshold of galaxy formation, and then. People have started suggesting things like, you know, these correlated astrometric signatures from subhalos coming in front of, but, but that's even more distant future. Eventually, we'd love to get down to, you know, solar mass halos, but I don't have a good idea to get there. Yeah, actually, you know, you reminded me. So Jorge Peña Rubia, he has uh, some suggestion that um, if you have, um, if you have, uh, these molds of halos, they would uh, uh, they would destroy closed binaries, and so you could tell how granular the halo of the Milky Way is by the distribution of um, um, of by the number of um, closed binaries. The trouble with that argument is that you need to know what the initial state for the closed binaries is, and and we only you know we we don't know what that is, so that relies on stellar on, on star formation. So. But that's another, in principle, possible method. But I think the most realistic are the other two. And the lensing, I'm extremely excited about the lensing. So I think it works. I mean, it's really hard, but I think it will work. Although it's not working yet in a conclusive way, but uh, all you need uh, is about 100 lenses with, the, uh, uh, quali with HST imaging quality and uh, uh, with the signal to noise of, of the Slack survey, you need 100 more or less. And then that will be able to tell us whether or not CDM is um, ruled out or not. And it's already about 100, but they don't have the right signal to noise and they're not really, very well chosen. But you know, with LSST, we'll have thousands. They, they need to be followed up because uh, they, you, you, need, you need very, very high resolution imaging. And oh, the other possibility is to do it in, in, in radio waves, in, radio, in, in some millimeter. So with ALMA, there's about three cases of uh, the strongly lensed uh, galaxies. And uh, so in principle, that may be even more powerful than, than optical imaging. 
You know, I've been trying all my life to rule out CDM. So I, I started my career ruling out warm dark matter. Sorry, hot dark matter, not warm, hot dark matter. It took six months to rule that out. My colleagues and I said, well, let's rule out CDM now. And, you know, 40 years later, we're still trying. So, so uh, it failed so far. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Miguel. Hi, yes, I have a question for also for Carlos. So uh, I, have, I must confess, I have not read your nature paper, but I saw your talk. So, and I was wondering, when you show your money plot, right, the one that goes 20 hours of magnitude or so and show there's a beautiful power law there. I mean, I, I'm, I'm confused. How, how, I mean, is that taking into account bionic effects, the hydrodynamic effects? Because I, I was not aware we could simulate the hydrodynamic effects in those scales. So I'm, I'm confused on what they can take. Given yeah, no, you, yeah, you're, right. So that's a very good point. And um, the, uh, the, the, the short answer is no, we don't have the hydro effects. Now, <clears throat> the hydro effects could be important because we know there's this um, streaming velocity between the baryons and, um, and, and the dark matter, and that streaming velocity will um, depress the growth rate of, uh, of the dark matter fluctuation. So uh, there will be undoubtedly an effect. Now, so now it's not easy to, the reason we didn't include it, we thought very hard about how we could do it. And it's absolutely non-trivial because um, the, um, so, so the, this, I mean, the streaming uh, uh, velocities between baryons and, um, uh, and, and dark matter, I think uh, Hirata, is, I think saw his name here. Anyway, so, so uh, they, you know, they have a coherence length, but the simulations we're doing in order to resolve the very small halos are tiny, right? They, they, uh, they, to resolve the earth mass halos, we had to find a way to do a simulation in which the whole uh, computational, well, actually the computational volume is cosmological, but the high resolution region of the computation was only, if I remember correctly, uh, 100 parsecs or something like that. And then how do you actually include baryon effects on those scales is absolutely non-trivial. So uh, I think um, maybe we need to do one of these um, uh, separate universe simulations. I, I don't quite, so we've been talking about how to do it. Now, and we haven't come up with an optimal way. Now, what effects would that have? I think the effect would be to suppress the mass function. Uh, and, um, but I don't think it will change the shape of the mass function. So it, it suppresses it. We did some very simple calculations and I think the amplitude could come down by a factor of two or so. But you know, I, we, I had 25 orders of magnitude in that uh, Y axis. So you never notice a factor of two. So I think it's a very good question. And um, but I, we don't know, I don't know exactly the answer, but I expect it would be um, just a change in amplitude. Yeah, so, Thank you. So just to, just to sorry. Okay, just understand, but you, you expect the power law to hold? That's your expectation? Yeah. Okay. I think it will just suppress, you, you just, it just reduce the amplitude of the mass function without changing the shape. But, but, uh, but you know, until, I, until we calculate that, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't put my hand on fire. I would put it on a very cold ice for about five minutes. I'm willing to do that, but I wouldn't put it on fire. So, so the, uh, but I mean, I could be wrong, but I, I think it will just be a, a, a suppression of the amplitude. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Cora. Yes, hi, Carlos. Um, Hello, I'm... Cora, how are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> Very well, thanks. Um, I have a question about line of sight halos. You, of course, have studied this a lot and pointed this out. And uh, in your works, when, when you detect this 10 to the 7 solar mass subhalo, is uh, and you put constraints on warm dark matter, are you taking the line, the possibility that it is a line of sight halo and therefore the mass would change and therefore the constraint would change? Or you're considering it to be a subhalo? How, how is this? Oh, that's a very good question. Uh, and uh, Cora, the very good question. And uh, so I think until um, a, a few years ago, somehow the notion in the people who are in this community was that it was subhalos that we were looking for. Now then it turns out that when you actually sit down and do the calculation, that most of the signal is not subhalos. Most of the signal is actually 
halos, independent, you know, central halos, as we call them, uh, field halos along the line of sight. So for example, there's a paper by Ran Lee, he's the first author, uh, and then uh, I, I'm, I'm somewhere, I think I may be the second author, but it was Ran Lee who did the calculations. And it, it, in the case of CDM, 80% of the signal for a lens at Brechit point two, which is the slack sample, and this will change with uh, the position of the lens and the source. But for a typical slack lens, 80% of the signal for CDM comes from this line of sight uh, field halos and 20% comes from sub halos. Now, if the, if the lens is far, farther out, then the fraction gets even more biased towards a line of sight. And that's the beauty, right? Because in uh, subhalos, you might worry, you know, do I really understand subhalos? You know, what if the, uh, they go through the disk and then they get destroyed? And the reason I don't see them is not that warm dark matter is the answer, it's just that the, the disk destroy them. Uh, and so that would be a worry if the signal was dominated by subhalos, but luckily, it is dominated by the line of sight. And that's such a beautiful experiment, right? Because this 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 solar mass uh, uh, field halos, they've never seen a baryon in their lives. Well, that's not quite true, apart from the last question. But they never had a baryon inside them, mm -hmm. right? So, so they never... Um, they live calmer uh, lives, yes. Yeah, they, they are pristine. You know, they are relics from, from the early universe. So, so that's, that's what I think makes this very exciting. Um, it does, as I say, depend on, on the actual lensing configuration. So, so yes. Now, uh, interestingly, for a slack lens, the if, if for warm dark matter, say, if you think the dark matter, if, if, if you believe uh, this uh, um, 3.5 keV line, which I don't know how many people here do, but if you did, and if the dark, if the dark matter was a 7 keV sterile neutrino, then for that particular case. Uh, the subhalos that for some reason, but well, reason I could explain are more important than for CDM. So, but they're still not dominant. So for the case of a 7 kV sterile neutrino and a slack lens, then whereas in CDM, 80% of the signal is field halos. In, in warm dark matter, uh, it's 60% uh, is field halo. So it's still dominated by field, but, um, but in warm dark matter, there is signal, there's more of these um, uh, subhalos. Uh, now, the other point you raise is very important because in these studies, there's a degeneracy between the mass and the redshift. So you get the same lensing signal from, from a little halo uh, that um, is uh, at some uh, redshift than you do from a bigger halo that is at a different redshift. So break, uh, so this mass, uh, it's called the mass uh, uh, redshift degeneracy, but it can be broken by, um, well, it's not, it's not obvious how you do it, but but if you you can, in principle, if you um, if you have a large sample of of, um, of lenses at various redshifts, you can break that degeneracy at some point. And so, but this is this is a problem. This mass uh, redshift degeneracy is a problem. So, but it's in principle something one can deal with. But I mean, at the moment, I think this community of people are still struggling to find a lens. Yeah. <laughs> I, I see Mona Vegetti. Uh, has several, and uh, Hesave has one, so so they are still very, very, very rare. Right, I agree. It's a second order problem. This one, but uh... yeah, no, but it's a very good question. Thank you. Sorry, thank you. Uh, next is Mark. Hello, um, I have a question for Carlos. Hi. Um, Hello, um, Mark. I haven't seen you for ages. Your hair has gone <laughs> shorter. <laughs> Right. Um, so, uh, well, I, I was wondering in, in this uh, uh, triple void or multiple void uh, simulation, um, uh, I, I, I looked through your, the, your paper and I couldn't immediately find it. Sorry if it's in there and I missed it, but um, is uh, what fraction of the matter and the volume consists of un, uncollapsed things? Um, like what, what fraction of the universe is in in um, in halos of any kind in the simulation. Yes. So um, uh, yes, Mark. So uh, this is something that's worried me for a long time. <laughs> so what fraction of the total mass is um, in, is in halos, and what fraction is just uh, kind of diffuse? And um, now the uh, I think the answer. So in that paper, we didn't touch on this, but um, the um, 
So the paper is, is, is I think it's on Astro PH and it's, a, it's also, it came out in Nature. So maybe that's where you can find it because Nature seems to be impossible to find, but it's on Astro PH. But I don't think we talked about that in that paper, but there's this very nice paper by uh, Raul Angulo uh, and Simon White. And I think there may be other authors I can remember. So they claim that, um, what's it, was it 80%? Of the mass is in, in in clumps of some of some of some size and uh, twenty percent is diffuse if I remember correctly. But you're right. This is something that we can directly now calculate. Uh, but uh, the reason we can't yet is because of the first question that uh, because we neglect the baryon effects, we don't really know what the amplitude of the mass function is. And of course, that's crucial because you just want to integrate under that mass function. So, so that's why we don't talk about that in that paper. But these other arguments by, by Raul uh, et al, uh, Angulo, I think they're, they're theoretical arguments. So they're quite general and, um, and they're, they're quite convincing. But I'm not quite sure if I got the, my recollection. Raul was my student, but I can't remember <laughs> exactly the number that um, they have, but it's of that order. Something like that, yeah. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. So next question is Renan Boschetti. Yes, uh, it's for Carlos also. Uh, so uh, can you explain better uh, what is the purpose of that zoom in you do in the dark matter only simulation? And what kind of information are you extracting uh, from that, that scales? Uh, uh, of a few mega, a few parsecs, sorry. And why is this information real, real, reliable for predicting anything in this scale? Because it seems very strange the structures we see on these scales. It's, yes, it seems very different from nature. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I don't know. No, no, wait a minute. We don't know what nature looks like in those scales. <laughs> so I agree with you that they're very weird. Now, so let me tell you, so this is a project that took seven years to do, precisely to try and answer your question. So what, what so the, the BVV is the name of the project because the strategy, so what you want to do, you want to have a cosmological simulation, you know, 500 megaparsecs, in fact, it's a millennium simulation size. You want to have that uh, size simulation, but you want to resolve an earth mass, 10 to the minus six solar masses. Uh, and um, which means you want to have a particle mass of 10 to the minus 10 or 10 to the minus 11 solar masses. Now, how do you do that? You say, well, it's impossible. So if I have a cosmological volume, 500 megaparsecs across, you know, the biggest objects there are 10 to the 15 solar masses. So how am I gonna get 10 to the minus 11? I would need um, 10 to the 26 particles just for one cluster, impossible, right? So what we did, uh, I mean, pre people before us have tried to do this problem, but they did it wrong. Uh, I can tell you why in a second, but what we did was this. We start with a big cosmological simulation. So let me, let me, let me show you the pictures, actually. That's probably the best thing. So let me share again, if I may. Is that okay, Rogerio, if I share again? Uh, so, right, so here is, um, right, okay. Now, can you see, you can see this, I hope. Now, so, so we have various levels of, um, of re-simulation. So they're all in that, every level of re-simulation re-simulates this uh, 500 megaparsec uh, cube. However, what we do is we find a region of low density, and then we have developed techniques uh, over the last 20 years that allows us to re-simulate this whole box, 500 megaparsecs, but, we can put more particles here and do this with much higher resolution. You have to, of course, uh, include the power spectrum uh, that you have left out, you have to add it. So we have a region of lower than average density and then we re-simulate with a hundred times more resolution. And then we keep doing this recursively. So, or not recursively, successively. So this is the first level of, of, um, of, uh, of re-simulation. I'm only showing you here the bit that was in the circle before. I'm only showing you here this, but it's actually outside this is the whole 500 megaparsecs. 
And so you keep doing this uh, uh, over and over again. So here, for example, these are 10 to the nine solar mass, the biggest objects. Uh, we look at a low density region, we simulate it with hundreds of times better resolution as level three. And now the region I'm showing you is smaller and smaller. Now this is about, I don't know, 500 kiloparsecs, half a megaparsec or so. But this is embedded in the bigs. Every time we re-simulate, re sorry, we re-simulate the big, the, big, the big box every time. So you keep going and it looks weirder and weirder. Here, the objects you see here are 10 solar masses. Uh, here, these ones are 10 to the minus one solar masses. And you see the cosmic web starts looking very bizarre. And by the time, uh, this is the next to last zoom. By the time you come to the last zoom where these objects are earth mass, right? So the particle mass in the simulation is 10 to the minus 11 solar masses. Now this looks really bizarre. Now the reason it looks really bizarre is two reasons. Uh, the one reason that you already, oh, sorry, you already see the bizarreness here. And that's because in here, they were in the power spectrum, the part of the power spectrum that's almost flat. So many structures are collapsing simultaneously. And so you see these very bizarre, sorry, these very bizarre things going on. Now here, in addition to that, we now have the cutoff in the power spectrum. So that's why these look so strange. Now, I don't know if nature, there, there is one artificial thing that Mark, I'm sure will recognize, Mark Nehring, uh, and many others probably, that uh, this is numerical. This fact that um, these um, filaments break up into small lumps, we understand what it is. It's uh, a discreteness problem. Uh, and um, we know probably how to cure it as well. But uh, those little kind of beads are artificial. But the rest, you know, the large scale structure and the number of these halos, that's, that's absolutely reliable. So I don't know if nature looks like this or not. We don't know, right? So. So the, uh, the whole thing across here is maybe a hundred parsecs or so, but, um, but this is, that, that was the strategy that we used. And it wasn't easy, I can tell you. It was, um, it was extremely difficult. As I say, it took us seven years to do this. And more importantly, uh, we stretched to breaking point two of the most um, famous distinguished uh, uh, cos uh, numerical cosmologists, um, Adrian Jenkins and Volker Springle, uh, we broke the codes time and again, you know, we were, it was a really, really hard thing because you're trying to simulate this tiny little dot in a great big volume. And moreover, it's moving really fast. Uh, and so it was really hard, but we, we finally did it. And we have all sorts of tests in the nature paper of convergence and um, changing this, changing the time step, changing that. Uh, and so I think the results are certainly, certainly reliable. Now, whether nature looks like this or not, I have no idea, but uh, if, if nature is made of CDM, then it should look like this. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I, I registered myself and then it's Bruno and then Claudius Cochlear that are registered. So I have, a, I have a very simple question, but the answer, I don't know if it's that simple. So I have this beautiful power law over several orders of magnitude that explains the mass function, universal function, etc. So the question, is there any analytical understanding of this? Because this is begging, I think, for an analytical understanding, right? So gravel thermal collapse, self-similar collapse, any of this can explain this beautiful universal mass function? Well, the, uh, you, think, you think it should be, right? Because the reason I think, I mean, at a kind of high level, the reason I, one should not be surprised it's a power law is because it's gravity, right? And uh, the only thing really is gravity, uh, but uh, gravity has no scale. On the other hand, you know, the power spectrum, so we're sampling a power spectrum that changes in slope from minus three to, to, to plus one, right? So to me, it wasn't completely obvious that it would come out to be a power law, but it did. Now, so you think, well, what happens if I compute the projector uh, mass function uh, which is the closest we have to an analytical description of the process. And um, so first of all, well, this is, this is a technical deep, but so first of all, we know already from even uh, smaller simulations at the ma more massive end, that the press check that is a good approximation, but it's not really, doesn't really get the right answer. And, um, uh, but then when you approach the cutoff, then the press check that doesn't work anymore because the press check that has a filter that assumes a continuous power spectrum. 
but but we know how to modify that. So in Bom Dank Mare, uh, there's papers that, uh, for example, like Sean Cole and Andrew Benson have written on this. So we know how to modify press check there to take into account the fact that suddenly you fall off a cliff in the power spectrum. But when you do that, um, it doesn't really come very, I mean, it comes close, but it doesn't have the right um, the right shape, you know, the, the, the changes, uh, it's not really a power law. And um, so, so yeah, so, so I think it would be, you'd think Preshectish would be the answer, but, but it doesn't really do it. And I, I guess Preshectish is just an approximation and it makes assumptions, you know, about the barrier crossings and all these kind of things, which do happen, but um, they um, make assumptions about um, lack of correlations that I don't think are there because the power spectrum, when it gets so flat, then things get correlated in, 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 in interesting ways. So it's not an easy problem analytical, analytically. But I, you know, it's, a very good, it's a very good point. Because there are some models of gravel, something called gravel thermal collapse and even self-similar collapse, but I'm not sure if they can reproduce this type yeah. of... Uh, well, right, because you know, if the because the power spectrum is is not a power law, right? right. Then then the self similar uh, solution doesn't really work, uh, and so the uh, yeah, so so but it's interesting. I mean, there must be some modification of uh, projector. We one uh, thinks hard enough, maybe one can come up with some modification of projector or something that will. Will, I mean, the other thing with Preshector is that everything is spherical in Preshector, although not explicitly, but implicitly. And as you could see, you have these very bizarre uh, yeah. non-spherical structures that form. Yeah. So that's the reasons why it doesn't work. Well, there's elliptical collapse. No, of it's course, there's the, the shed and Tormen. Yeah, uh, uh, that's uh, okay. uh, Yeah, it's, it's white and silk, all this kind of stuff. Uh, but even then, it only still very simplified. Yes. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, so Bruno, and then Claudia, and I think, I think we're done after that. Hi, Carlos. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Hi, Bruno. Um, this is a, a naive question. Okay? I'm not an expert at all in this. I, I know zip about uh, galaxy dynamics. I should probably read uh, Bini and Tremaine for my sins. Uh, <laughs> You'll have so, a very good Christmas if you do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I was surprised with your uh, last level of the simulations at the 25 parsec scale. And uh, I didn't go to Bini and Tremaine, but I did go to Google to get some plots of, of our local region. And this is inside our galaxy. And I mean, we know that things are more or less like spherical, but also collapsed into disks and, 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 and stuff like that. And that at least for the untrained eye, it looks not at all like the simulations you show, of course, those are CDM. Those are not like bright stuff and we see the bright stuff. So my question to you is a bit, um, are they really similar and it's just my completely untrained eye that is interpreting everything wrong? Or if not, what is the physics that could like, that is missing in, in those large scale simulations that could bring them more like looking like the solar system? Because it seems to me that we, we are able to simulate stuff like that too, right? So, well, I mean, right. what am I missing? What am I missing? No, 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 you're not, no, your question is not naive. So, so let me clarify. So the simulations we did and the region that you saw with these funny filaments and so on, that is a, uh, it's not a inside a Milky Way halo. It's, it's, it's a field, you know, it's actually a region of, um, of low density. And um, so it's not inside. So the solar system is of course inside the galactic halo. So all the simulations that we did were of regions that are not inside uh, a bigger halo because we couldn't possibly do a simulation of simultaneously a galactic halo and an earth mass halo. So, so you wouldn't see that kind of, even if you had dark matter eyes and you could look at the dark matter, you wouldn't see that because um, I say that refers to, to a region, a field region and uh, not to a region inside another halo. However, having said that, uh, to go back to the um, Alex's question about the annihilation radiation. So uh, we need to now understand how these small halos behave when they fall into a Milky Way halo, right? If we want to make predictions, say for gamma rays, for CTA or whatever gamma ray uh, observatory comes in the future, then 
we will most likely see the gamma rays from the Milky Way. So we need to understand what happens to these small halos when they fall into the Milky Way. Now, you couldn't possibly do an ad initial simulation of that. It's just impossible. But uh, there are other ways around it. Uh, and in particular, uh, there is a technique that was um, invented by uh, an, an old student in, well, not old, I mean, a student who was in Durham a long time ago in 2011, a guy called Ben Lowing. He developed a technique whereby you can um, look at a, say, a simulation of a galactic halo, and then uh, you can reconstruct the potential after you run the simulation doing a, a expansion, a polynomial expansion uh, in some basis, and you can have a sort of analytical uh, polynomial expansion type description of the evolution of the whole halo. So you re can reconstruct the formation, say, of the Milky Way halo with this technique. It doesn't cost you any computational time. And then you can then throw Earth mass objects into this galactic halo and see what happens to them. So, uh, so, so that that will answer part of your question, not not the whole of your question, but it will answer at least the question of what happens to these um, ten to the minus six and ten to the minus three and ten to the one and so on solar mass halos when they fall into into a galactic halo, and that is crucial, as I say, for understanding uh, the uh, uh, the gamma ray emission if if it is there. So, yeah, but don't 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 identify that bizarre looking level eight simulation with the, with the solar system, because um, it doesn't apply to the solar system. Okay, hey. thanks. So if I can just uh, uh, follow up a little bit. So for the, for the eye, if we're doing try to go high by eye, it, it looks kind of fractal, right? We're going down, 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 and it still looks like filaments of the cosmic web. So intuitively, uh, it, it kind of seems like what you're saying is, is, is analogous to saying that if we do clipping, of the denser regions of the universe, we are going. We are looking at regions where the delta uh, of perturbations is small, and what it seems to be essentially saying is that um, this delta will be self-similar with scale. Right? You go to smaller scales, and 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 whatever topology you get in the lower density environments will be very similar to the to the topology that you get in the large scales when you are still in low, the low density too. So it would seem that the low density drives the shape more than the physical scale. Uh, is that a, does that sound like a reasonable interpretation? Well, it's, it's not. It's not a fractal, first of all, um, and um, even you know the, the mass function is not a fractal either, right? Because the slope is minus one point nine. So we just we just say we just miss the fractal of minus two. But the um, so 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 you're saying well, are the different uh, uh, the different the cosmic web on the different levels that we saw, are they in some way self-similar? Uh, I, don't, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, to the eye, they don't look self-similar because you get these very strange, uh, very straight filaments in the... Um, so Mark Nairik knows all about this. So I don't know what he thinks, but uh, the, um, you, you see these very bizarre straight filaments that I don't like. They're not like a... Uh, uh, if, if I put them side by side, uh, I could tell that um, this one came from uh, part of the power spectrum that's uh, n equals minus one and this. However, what is very interesting is that the structure of the halos, uh, that is self-similar. That is uh, NFW uh, and uh, all the way from the Earth mass to, to galaxy clusters. And that is very mysterious because uh, there's something in gravitational collapse that, um, um, I mean, this NFW seems to be some kind of attractor. And that one does appear to be at least universal. So if I put in a picture on the screen of a galactic halo and a 10 to the minus six halo, and I don't tell you which is which, and I scale them up so you see the same square, you wouldn't be able to tell me uh, which is the 10 to the minus six and which is the 10 to the 15. So in that sense, these two, so this, the internal structure seems to be self-similar, but I think the cosmic web uh, doesn't, at least to my eye. I don't know if Mark, if Mark Nairik uh, wants to say something about this. He, he knows all about this. <laughs> um, well, I, I don't really have a particular, a particularly strong opinion that you didn't already articulate it. Yeah, it's, it's not perfectly self-similar, um, but yeah, you get uh, filaments and the cosmic webs with some similarity 
uh, all, all the way down the, the mass scale. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a, a good answer. <laughs> all right. Yeah, no, me neither. Okay. okay. Uh, yes. <laughs> so let's go to the, uh, sorry, thank you very much. Uh, so let's go to the last question. So Claudia Coppola, please. Okay, hello. Uh, so my question was uh, related to what uh, Carlos was saying. Uh, and it's about uh, which is the criteria to choose this region that you re-simulate. Sorry, sorry, can you repeat that? Because uh, there was a slight glitch, yes. Sorry, sorry. Uh, again, so what was the criterion to choose the regions in which you re-simulate the, the simulation uh, each time? Right, so this was, uh, we, just, we just looked at the volume <laughs> and we just picked the region. So we didn't have any, any, objective, uh, any objective criteria. So we just chose a region that didn't have any big object in it because then we wouldn't be able to do the simulation. So, uh, but it actually turns out that it doesn't matter. So uh, one of the important plots that, um, let me just share again of this work, which we didn't know beforehand whether it was going to come out like this or not. So one of the important plots is this one, which I didn't, unfortunately, it looks like I commented it out because I only had 30 minutes. So apologies for that. So it's commented out from my, from, from the, oh, it's still commented out here. So let me, so it's this one. Let me just get rid of the uncommented, right? And uh, now, so yes, I didn't have time to talk about this, which is very important. So what this shows is the concentration of the halo as a function of the local environment. So we define the local environment around each halo, which is just uh, essentially the density in a kind of um, um, in, a, in, a, in a shell around it, of some dimensions between five and 10 times the virial radius. And then we ask the question, is the concentration, uh, does it depend on environment? Because we chose in these kind of um, odd regions with low density. So you might worry, well, you've simulated some bizarre part of the universe. How do you know this applies in general? And the reason we know is this, that the concentration uh, it's essentially independent. I mean, it's a bit of dependence, but it's effectively independent of environment. So that says that, um, that which maybe is not so surprising, it was just gravitational dynamics after all. But what this tells us is that um, even though we chose these regions that we could simulate in a finite amount of uh, time in a computer, that in no way special. So, so the concentration is independent of the environment. So, so that's the answer to your question. We chose these regions arbitrarily just so that we could re-simulate them, but then a posteriori we showed that uh, the choice um, uh, didn't really influence the, the result. And so I think the thing that's very interesting, right, is that um, the, the regions, even though we chose them to be low density, they're actually typical density because <laughs> the distribution of density is very skewed, right? So. So, so the, the, the mean density of the universe and the median density of the universe are very different. And so uh, it turns out that the regions that um, we re-simulated are about the median density for their size. They're not the mean, they're very low in the mean, but they're, they're typical in that um, uh, the median, they're in the media, they're, they're close to the median density for the region that size. So that's something that uh, is not uh, often appreciated, but uh, you know, the mean density of the universe is one thing, but the typical, and it's very biased because um, the distribution is very asymmetrical, but the, uh, the, the median, which is the typical value, that, uh, that is very different from the mean. And um, in particular, all these regions we had here turns out to be perfectly typical. They're median, they have the median density roughly. So that probably explains why uh, this empirical result, which I think is crucial, that the concentration is independent of the environment. Uh, I think that's where it comes from. Did that answer your question? Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. Right. Yes, yes. Thank, thank you, Carlos. Uh, thank you, Claudia. So we are uh, ending the session now. Uh, just, I just want to react to the uh, last 30 seconds of the video of Carlos by saying that, Carlos, you have an open invitation to come to Brazil when this thing is over, OK? Just uh, write to me, <laughs> and uh, we can arrange your visit to Brazil. Thank Please. you, thank you. I'm, I'm a great fan of Brazil. So I've been there a few times and I uh, always enjoy it a lot. And, you know, I like the place, I like the country. I like Please the bring some vaccines with you in the suitcase for us. 
was that? What was Bring that? some vaccines for us. <laughs> uh, I was just kidding. Say, bring some vaccines because vaccines. here we are a bit, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, no, a bit was, delayed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was just reading that the vaccines they don't take them very seriously in, in Brazil. It's very tragic, right? So, yeah, the trouble is I have to bring them uh, at minus eighty centi, uh, eighty Kelvin. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, <laughs> okay, wait so for the other vaccines that don't need to be frozen. So, but you come, don't worry, this, this thing will go over and you come. So I want to thank everybody that participated in the session. And this was a great session. I really appreciate the discussions. And uh, so we will meet tomorrow again. So uh, see you guys tomorrow. Goodbye. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. See you Goodbye. tomorrow. Uh, thanks for the speaking. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you.